Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. So today we're going to look at the, one of the latest additions to the Artifact 8-bit computer herd, or hoard, or whatever you like. I picked this up locally and uh, I was assured that uh, it was in full working condition. Looks okay, it's a bit dirty. One of the most, it came with a bunch of stuff. One of the most important things that came with it is the power brick. It looks more like a power house, power outhouse or something like that. It is rather large. It supplies 9 volts AC at 1 amp and 5 volts DC at 4 amps. Sure, in this day and age you can probably build anything. But it's still a pain because you got to get a switching power supply that'll output 4 amps at uh, 5 volts DC at 4 amps. Not a big deal. But then you got to add a transformer to step down AC to 9 volts AC. And the worst part of it all is that this is the connector it uses, the power connector. I think this is called a square DIN plug because it's got five pins. They're not being used or made anymore, even though there's rumors that somebody had these sourced in China is, or is having them custom uh, made. So you can still get them, but you get the point. It's quite a pain to have to come up with a replacement supply here. So if you get one of these, make sure it comes with the supply or pay very little for it. One of the real neat things it came with was this, uh, can you see that? The uh, Modem 300 model 1680. It's a 300 baud modem. Came in the box with the manual. Looks like it was never used. And probably that's the way it'll stay. Anyway, so uh, let's have a look and see what goes on here. I'm not going to make sque squeaks of excitement uh, if it comes on or, or be very disappointed if it doesn't because I've already tested it. And uh, it's going to need some work. Okay, ready for lift off. Is the monitor on? Yes. And it comes on. Squeal of, squeal of pleasure because it came on. I have to do that. But anyway, here it is. Uh, 122 K bytes free. Uh, this is the uh, Commodore 128 mode. Now, uh, this showed me one of the first problems. And that is, keys are, some of the keys are acting weird. I am pressing the comma. Of course, now it won't do it. There you go. My hand is not on the keyboard. It's just sitting in there. Some unknown substance has been spilled on it, I guess. You have to pry it out. The period key does the same thing. And the G key. So, at a minimum, we're going to have to take the keyboard apart. I don't even know what sort of mechanics it uses. But, well, the key contact obviously works. It's auto-repeating. I think that's in the OS. It's not the keyboard, but the OS is detecting the key pressed and just auto-repeats it. But we've got to find out why mechanically this thing is sticking. But we can always, where is the G? Free it. and go on. Now, another thing is this uh, computer is set to be fully compatible with the Commodore 64. And the way you go there is you basically hold the uh, Commodore key down 
while turning it on. And there you go. It's in 64 mode now. Lost a bit of memory there, but it's a true emulation. Well, actually, no, it's true simulation of the uh, Commodore 64. But one thing, I don't know if you can hear this. Now you can. It's buzzing pretty good, right? Capacitor problem. Uh, no. Well, it could be a capacitor problem also, but it looks like this isn't generating any sound. So let's put in a cartridge. Something that I know has sound. And uh, let's see, F1 is the start key? Yes. So you have to make your own sound effects here because the sound doesn't work. Colors look horrible in the video. They actually look really nice on the monitor. Green, blue, gray. That's what it's supposed to be like. Maybe one of these days I'll get a new camera. But So there's problem number two. No sound. Another thing uh, this computer does is it will function in 80 column mode. And uh, there's a key on the keyboard that lets you select 80 columns or 40 columns, a latching key, and it will run CPM. So that means it's got a 6502 and a Z80 inside. They don't run simultaneously, but they share all the other system resources. And we'll have a look. Uh, yeah, why don't we have a look at the uh, system block diagram to see what wonderful things are contained in this computer. I've got a box full of books with this thing and some of the highlights include and are going to provide me with lots of reading material is uh, this tome here and it's the CPM Plus manual, CPM version 3.0 and it's got everything in it. User's Guide, Programmer's Guide, and System Guide. So I'll be reading this for a few months or years before bedtime. And I'm sure when I got get through with this, I'll be an expert in CPM. Another book is the uh, also not a trivial sized book. Is the uh, Programmer's Reference Guide. And this contains a block diagram of the machine. So let's have a quick look at that. So what we have, it's, it's not printed very dark, so just squint. So it's got an 8502, which is a 6502 with, I'm not exactly sure, it'll run faster or, but it's, it's core compatible. And a Z80. Now again, notice, uh, I, or remember I said they're not, they don't run simultaneously. One of them runs. They've done some magic here. Here's basically the uh, bus, the resource interface. And they've set it up so that the resources, again, can be shared because it's mapping and translating control signals and everything over here. So the Z80 and the 6502 can access pretty much anything that's on the bus. Bunch of I.O. chips, sound chip, ah, sound chip. I'm going to have to have a look at that. Now the video is actually separate. It's got a, it's got two separate video circuits. It's got an 80 column uh, video chip, an 8563 with its own DRAM attached to it. I didn't show you the uh, 80 columns because I don't I don't really have a monitor. I do have a monitor but uh, I was too lazy to pull it out. No big deal. It just shows the exact same screen in Commodore 128 mode 
uh, in 80 columns, and of course you need that also to run CPM. Well, you don't actually know you don't need it, but uh, it's probably kind of stupid to run CPM in 40 columns. But anyway, so here's our 80 columns, and then over here we have the VIC video chip, which outputs the 40 character mode and uh, gives you has the uh, sync luminosity and chroma and composite video outputs over here whereas this is an R has RGB output so it actually has two different outputs or plugs on the computer then it's got memory and then it's got a frightening array of uh, ROMs over here in order to support all the modes because it, I think it has separate ROMs for 80 columns 40 columns in uh, uh, 128 mode and then it has another one for the uh, C64 mode and well I tried to make it compatible with everything and uh, throw everything but the kitchen sink at it for new features and uh, this was late in the 80s seems a little bit desperate to me you would think that they were that Commodore was on the way of uh, starting to make PC compatibles but uh, I don't know uh, it's out there it didn't sell nearly as well as the C64. As a matter of fact, people were still buying C64s when this came out. But it's still a neat piece of equipment. Here's a peek at the systems guide that in the middle has this section, I guess, selling points. What do you need selling points for? Some poor schmuck bought this thing already. But anyway, it's a graphics are easy to use on the Commodore 128 as you can see from the high-res images that they show you and uh, here's this uh, captain looking guy and uh, says ship to shore communicating made easy with your Commodore computer and modem okay well we're almost there and finally, so they show this kid going to, going to class. The Commodore 128 and student heading for a class. Now one thing they conveniently neglected in this picture is, where is the power brick? I mean, is he pulling a hand cart with the brick, or has the brick been delivered already by FedEx to the class? I think this is a, quite funny, because I doubt that anybody ever took their Commodore 128 to class, whether they be in high school or in college or getting their PhD. But at least Commodore was trying. So I took out a bunch of screws. And I think the way this works is we got to turn it over. And uh, oh, did the last screw just fall out? Yes, I was missing this one. So, uh, Let's see, my proprietary uh, case separation tool here. Let's see, now the back kind of lifts off. Yep, there's tabs. That wasn't so bad, right? Yeah, it was. I've been trying to figure this out for the last 15 minutes. Uh, how to open this thing without breaking the shit out of the tab, so. But, if I knew then what I know now. So at this point, let's see, there's a bunch of cables underneath, carefully. This is the LED connection, and this is the keyboard connection. Oh. And there's also a ground strap. Over here, that's inconveniently bolted in. And with that done, ta-da! We lift off the top, which contains the keyboard, and 
the bottom, which contains a large RF shield. So there are three latching keys that have two jumpers each soldered to the uh, keyboard PCB, which we'll have to remove. And for those of you who enjoy watching this sort of stuff, I could have used a solder sucker, but you have to suck the solder out later on anyway. So, might as well use the braid and clean out the contact. See, it's actually can free. And I'll do the other ones off camera. But there's also a large number of very small screws here required to be removed and uh, we all know how to use a Phillips screwdriver but make damn sure you have the right size uh, screwdriver here these things strip rather easily because they are inserted somewhat firmly at least on my keyboard oh and before you do that you should remove these screws which hold the keyboard assembly to the top plastic case. The four screws up here, they have uh, plastic spacers. And also make sure to note how the power LED is mounted because there's like an extra part that holds it in place and uh, I hear if you don't observe exactly how that is inserted it can be quite a puzzle when putting it back. So this is interesting. The key comes out pretty easily. You pull off the key top. With, I use a chip remover for that, but you can buy a special tool for that. And you end up with the key top and the corresponding spring. And then the plunger comes out the other end. And uh, I cleaned the plunger all the way around. I cleaned the inside, the housing, and it still sticks. And let's see, can I make you see what's wrong with this? Took me a while to see, but... Oh... See that white line showing up on the inside of the plunger cylinder? That's not a white line. That is basically you seeing the background. The plunger has cracked and thus is slightly expanded and because of that pressure it doesn't travel freely through the housing and gets stuck. So best case we put <clears throat> a little bit of super glue in there with a toothpick and see if we can get it to hold together and if not I'll probably have to file the outside of the uh, plunger so that it moves properly through the housing. So let's give that a try and for those of you <clears throat> wanting to know what the right size screwdriver is, there it is. Phillips of course. I think I found a better solution. Use at your own risk, but uh, here's the result. So the problem is, as I explained, that because of a crack in the cylinder of the plunger, the circumference has basically increased and is thus rubbing out against the uh, part it sits in. So my first idea was of course to draw, put a couple drops of super glue in the, tr in the crack and hope that it wouldn't spill out on this end and you know super glue sometimes uh, will run and will dry in the most inconvenient of places. So why not enlarge the hole? And that's exactly what I did to fix this one. And the way I did that is 
you take a tool like this, a reamer, and what I did was I ran it into the hole and gave it one, without pushing down on it, just gravity holding it down, gave it one full 360 degree turn. Actually, you probably want to start off by giving it half a turn and then test to see if that's enough to let the plunger travel freely in its cracked state or not. And then basically repeat that until the plunger is no, lo no longer gets stuck. Again, do it at your own risk because uh, you are widening the hole and there may be an argument. What if you get new plungers? They'll be wobbly and so on and so forth. Let's just say I won't be using this keyboard very heavily and all I need is for the comma key and the period key and the G key, of course, not to get stuck. So that worked well, actually. I did the period key too. Note though that on that one it took more than a full turn, it took like two and a half turns of the reamer to get this plunger to move uh, smoothly, but that's done. I still have to do the G, but first I noticed this really nasty stain on two keys, and I've been working on the J key for a while. And the stuff doesn't want to come off. I mean, it's coming off slowly but surely, but I shudder to think what it is. So uh, let me slip into my hazmat suit, get these keys cleaned up, fix the G, and then we, then we should be ready to test the keyboard. All right, I, uh, I had to use an X-Acto knife to get that brown stuff off. It just wouldn't come off. And it scratched the side of the key a little bit, but you can't see it because it's in between keys. And anything is worth doing to the key to get rid of your fellow man's finger waste. So that's clean. I uh, also noticed that when I desoldered this, I fully obscured your view of it. So for those of you who couldn't figure it out, uh, imagine that this is soldered to this pin right now. I used some uh, desoldering braid. See, I'm doing it again. I used some desoldering braid. Like this. And then pressed the tip of the soldering iron against the contact until all of the solder was taken up by the wick. And there you have it. Now, of course, uh, one other small problem is this spring fell out of the keyboard. I cannot figure out where it goes. All of the latching keys work, everything works, but this was laying on the bench, so I can't even be 100% sure that it came out of the keyboard, but hey, if you have any idea what this is, I mean, what it is for, in this particular application, please let me know. Also the cracked uh, plunger cylinders I mean uh, somebody must have gotten really pissed off at the keyboard and just wailed on it because there are stress cracks that could be caused by excessive pressure from the top but here we go, these keys are good, G is good, and the gap between H and J is clean. Haha, -ha, and you can't even see the scratches. So the keyboard is back together, let's temporarily put the machine together again and make sure that everything on the keyboard works. All right, so I cleaned up a bit and uh, put this together temporary, temporarily, so I don't have to stress the uh, tabs too much. But let's see. If the keys now properly work.
So the comma key is good. Period key is good. And the G is good. So keyboard fixed, I mean that was not what I was expecting. I just thought it was like caked up with dirt or something in there, but uh, you learn something new every time. But that's not all. I also got a 1571 disk drive and, uh, and a box of disks. So I stuck, the, stuck a disk in there and uh, should probably boot this up in uh, C64 mode. That didn't work. Let's try that again. Hold the uh, Commodore key. All right. Load star eight. I think it tells me on the disk what to do. No, I'm not that uh, fluent in Commodore basic commands. And there you go, now loading Raid on Bungling Bay by Broken by Blade Runner. And this is going to take a really long time. Really, really long, which was a common thing with Commodores. So it took a little more than two minutes to get to this point. But looks like the drive worked. And we can play. I probably can't see this on the sc uh, on the video, but I'm actually shooting. Can you see that? It's a single black pixel, no sound. But it works. Is it worth waiting two minutes for? I don't know, that's open for a debate. But anyway, we are at a point. I think that's enough for today. Not today, for this episode. Uh, or today. We definitely need sound to fully enjoy this system and uh, or to also see if there's anything else wrong with it. So, uh, for now I'm going to finish up here. And uh, thanks for watching. Thumbs up would be appreciated. A subscription would be great. And what would even be better, constructive comments. Loved seeing your comments. And uh, I will do my best to answer them. Oh, somebody's shooting at me there. But uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>